Welcome to worship. Today we enter Holy Week and celebrate the Sunday of the Passion, Palm Sunday. The procession with palms recalls Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Our scripture readings today are the Passion according to the Gospel of Mark. Through Jesus' death, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, the supreme manifestation of the steadfast love of God. Thank you to our musicians and to Kathy Gustafson, our liturgist. Holy Week will continue on Monday, Thursday, April 1st. 6.30 p.m. will be Holy Communion in the parking lot, weather permitting. Please bring your chair, um, your bread, and wear a mask. And at 7 o'clock on Thursday, our online service of, Hol of Monday, Thursday will begin. Good Friday is Friday, April 2nd, from 4 to 6 p.m. We invite you to please sign up for a 15-minute slot of, of prayer and meditation in our sanctuary at 7 o'clock on Monday, or on, excuse me, on Good Friday. Our, that service will become available online. And then on Easter Sunday, 641, the sunrise service will become available online. 845, resurrection of our Lord, Easter Sunday, and at 9 a.m., you're invited to the parking lot to hear the Easter story and music in person. Welcome to worship. Good morning, everybody. It is time for the children's sermon. Today is Palm Sunday, which means Easter is just one week away. And what a week. Here at church, we call this week Holy Week. And there are special days of the week where we focus on different parts of the Bible story. And each day takes us one step closer to Easter. Now, I have a gift for you to celebrate Holy Week at home. So I want you to come to church and I want you to pick up one of these bags. Um, it's a white bag and there's some instructions um, so you'll know what to do. But I have to tell you, my confirmation students, they were amazing helpers for this project and they filled special Easter eggs for Holy Week for you. So in the bag, you're gonna find a green egg for Palm Sunday, a pink or purple egg for Maundy Thursday, a glow-in-the-dark egg for Good Friday, and a golden egg for Easter Sunday. Now, I'm not gonna show you what's in all of the eggs, because I want you to come and pick it up and figure it out for yourself. But I am going to show you the Palm Sunday egg as an example. So in every egg, there's a surprise and a Bible verse. And so we're going to open the Palm Sunday egg right now. All right, so we're going to unroll it. And again, the confirmation students did an awesome job putting these together. So there's a Bible verse to read. It says, Palm Sunday. Today's Bible verse, Mark 14, 8 to 9. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, praise God. So you open the egg, you read the Bible verse, and I'll tell you, today's surprise is a green bouncy ball. Because I can just picture the people who were there when Jesus entered Jerusalem. They were so excited. They must have been just bouncing up and down. They were so excited. And so that is the, the egg for today. Now remember, there's more eggs for the rest of the week. You get to open the green one today. And then you open another one on Thursday. Read the Bible verse and see the surprise. You read, do another one on Good Friday read the Bible verse and see the surprise. And then on Easter Sunday, you get to open the golden egg, read the Bible verse and enjoy the surprise. This is one thing that we as your church want to give to you. Uh, so come to church, pick up your little white bag. Um, again, the, the, there's instructions in here too, so you know exactly what to do. But I want you to celebrate Holy Week. There's just one week until Easter, and it's a big week. It's a big deal. It's so important that here at church, we call it Holy Week, and I want you to celebrate with us. So let's say a prayer you can repeat after me. Dear God, 
Bless us this week. Help us celebrate Holy Week. Help us hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Don't forget to stop by church and pick up your Holy Week at home bag and enjoy those eggs as we're getting closer and closer to Easter. Thanks, everyone. Our procession with palms. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Our processional gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. The next day, a great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will, and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Were you there when they crucified?
crucified my Lord. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Gospel for Palm Sunday begins with Mark 1 and Mark 8. From Mark 1, verse 1, the first verse of the Gospel. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then from Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 1, is a title for the entire gospel, all 16 chapters. The story that Mark tells from Jesus to the crucifixion and resurrection is only the beginning. The drama of the gospel of Jesus Christ reaches beyond the end of the gospel of Mark and comes to us today. 
So what is this gospel, this good news? And the answer is in the meaning of the word Christ. Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? But who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. And then Jesus gives the job description for being the Christ. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the leaders, be killed, and three days rise again. The content of the good news of the gospel involves crucifixion and resurrection. This, Mark tells us, is good news. This is how heaven and earth, God and humanity, come together in this stunning way. God is with us. But the good news of the gospel is not just about Jesus. That good news, that gospel, is extended to us. When Jesus says, if any of the crowd or the disciples want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We learn that life for which we are created comes to us in the shape of a cross, dying and rising. And the drama of the Gospel of Mark reaches to us not in a philosophy or a social gathering, but in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ lived out among his followers. This is how the heavens are ripped open, the spirit is present, lives are transformed, the cross of Jesus Christ reaches to us today. Our gospel reading for Palm Sunday continues with Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another. That one they killed. And so it, uh, it was with many others. Some they beat, others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is amazing in our eyes. A parable is a story that connects the word to the listener. This parable invites those who hear it into the story. It's a story of a vineyard and a wine press. It's a story of owner of the vineyard and tenants. And then the owner leases the vineyard to the tenants. They have a contract, an official agreement that they will use to govern their relationship. At the time of the harvest, the slave comes 
from the owner to the tenants. The slave represents the owner. And what happens? Extreme injustice. This was not what was called for in the contract. Seized, beat, sent away. A second one came, beat and insulted. Another came, killed. Many others came, were beaten and killed. Injustice is piling up. And the deeper question here is the question of power. Who has the ultimate power? Is it the power of the tenants to beat and insult and kill? Or is it the power of the owner? And of course, the climax of the story is the owner says, I have my beloved son. I will send my beloved son to the tenants. Surely they will respect him. And what happens? They seize him, kill him, and throw him out of the vineyard. Is that the end of the story? In biblical language, the word injustice means a disruption of equilibrium, an action that takes place that destroys the balance of life or an agreement. These tenants have seized the inheritance by killing the beloved son by force of evil. And why should we be surprised? By this time in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen confrontation with power over and over again. Jesus meets the demons, the unclean spirits, the devil, the religious leaders. He meets the fears and unbelief of his disciples. In this story, of course, God is the owner. And God has the power to destroy and give the vineyard to someone else. But much more than that, God has the power to take this act of injustice and turn it into redeeming action of the universe. By means of the death of the beloved son, God is loving, forgiving with the creation at the deepest place of death and loss. And as Mark tells the story, he uses the language of Psalm 118, the psalm that says the stone that was rejected has become the chief cornerstone. When the early church interpreted Jesus' death and resurrection, they turned to Psalm 118. Twelve times in the New Testament, Psalm 118 is quoted as God's action in the death and resurrection of Jesus. All four Gospels use this psalm to describe Jesus' death and resurrection, beginning with Mark, the first gospel. So let's look at Psalm 118, written after the exile. After the question of exile, when the people of God asked the question, where is God in exile? And when they returned to the promised land, this is the first verse of Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. And then Psalm 118 rehearses the story of injustice and opposition. The psalmist says, I cried out, surrounded by enemies and powers falling, and God, Yahweh, has become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected, in this case, the death of the beloved son, has become the cornerstone. And then the psalm ends with that same verse with which it began. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Even in the rejection and death and injustice, that becomes a vehicle for the steadfast love of God to reach into the world. This is the gospel. This is the good news, not just restoring justice, where the tenants get what they deserve. And that's probably a pretty good thing, right? Beating, insulting, killing, and seizing do not have the last word in this story. But more than giving the tenants their justice is that this act of rejection, the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, the death of the beloved son, has become the supreme expression of the steadfast love of God. 
God's unconditional love and mercy to the entire creation. God's love has transformed the rejection of the cross into the foundation of life itself. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Passion narrative of Mark continues with the trial of Jesus in Mark chapter 14. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And all of them condemned him as deserving death. The trial of Jesus is the triumph of darkness. The word for testimony is the word for witness. This positive word is turned into its opposite. Gave false testimony is literally witnessed falsely. And the question then of the high priest, are you the Christ, the Christ, the same word from Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And Jesus answer, I am. And upon hearing the answer, the high priest tore his clothes because of the charge of blasphemy, of claiming to be God, using the divine name, I am. And they all shout out that he is deserving death. Ironically, bringing about the fulfillment of Jesus' identity, where he says the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected and be killed. Jesus is found guilty as the Christ. Passion narrative of Mark continues with Mark chapter 15. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, 
Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. At the crucifixion, there is darkness at noon, out of order. Jesus cries out with the words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The ultimate lament. He breathes his last. The breath of life leaves him. The curtains are ripped, torn in two, schizoed. It recalls the heavens being ripped apart at Jesus' baptism, with the spirit, the breath descending, and the voice saying, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased as a servant. This is exactly what is happening on the cross. Now another ripping happens, the ripping of the curtain to the Holy of Holies, the presence of God in the temple, giving every person access to God's presence. Mark is telling us that the present reality in the universe is that God is with us. In unspeakable darkness, through the death of the beloved Son, Jesus is the Son of God. God with us, thanks be to God. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. In Jesus, you came along us as a suffering servant. Give your church humility. Redeem your people from pride and the certainty that we always know your will. Heal us and empower us to confess Christ crucified. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In creation, life springs from death. Redeem your creation awaiting resurrection. Restore lost habitats and endangered species. Create new possibilities for areas affected by climate change. Grant relief from natural disasters and nurture new growth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Jesus was headed over to the powers of this world. In all nations, instruct the powerful that they would not exploit their power, but maintain justice. Sustain soldiers and guide those who command them, and they will serve those in greatest need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. On the cross, Jesus joined all who feel forsaken. Abide with those who are condemned to death. Defend those who are falsely accused. Console and strengthen those who are mocked or bullied. Accompany all who suffer. Your mercy is great. You called us followers to tend Jesus' body in death. Sustained hospice workers and funeral directors. Bless this congregation's ministries at times of death. Those who plan and lead funerals 
those who prepare meals, all who offer support in grief. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You inspired the centurion to confess Jesus as your son. We praise you for the faith you have given to all people of all places and times. Give us also such faith to trust the promises of baptism and, with them, to look for the resurrection of the dead. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves to all our prayers to you, O faithful God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. At this time we receive our offering. On Palm Sunday, we love because God first loved us. We respond to God's love by offering ourselves our time and our possessions. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we gather in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>